So there's four parts to this presentation. The first is sharing. The second is usage models. The third is repairing. And the fourth is reusing. So sharing. So we have these assets, these fixed durable goods that we have in our businesses. For example, we have our tools and our fishing gear. We can have processing equipment. We can have large plant equipment, such as boats. We can have large production sites, such as buildings. We can have storage spaces. We can have logistics, cars and vans and so forth. We can have distribution systems, such as markets or small shops. And we also have these variable consumable inputs to our businesses. So we have energy production and storage. We have fresh water and ice, for example. And we also have communication equipment and knowledge. And so we can share these, these elements, these assets, in, in three different ways we can organize ourselves to share these things. And the first way we can organize is most common, we all know, through the market. We can sell or rent things through the market. But we have three, so what is it, what's the second one? The second one is the commons. So we can create an association or we can create a cooperative and we can share things through these non-market uh, organizations. We can also share things through public entities. So, for example, Farnet is an entity, a public entity, where we share knowledge between ourselves. So what's the advantage? Well, the technical term is that we reduce idle or duplicated capacity. So basically, if we imagine, instead of all of us owning a hand drill, we can share a hand drill between us. In theory, we, we, we need less hand drills for all our needs. That means that basically we have a higher efficiency of use, and we use less materials to answer to our needs. It also means we're sharing risk. We're also sharing learning, and we, have high, we can afford to have higher quality equipment because we can get economies of scale. And therefore, we're helping the environment, but also potentially we're lowering our input costs. So some example could be pooling distribution of the fish from the landing sites to the auction, the sharing of dredging equipment already being done in the flag in Estonia. We could imagine sharing ice, uh, ice machines. There's already a project in a flag in Finland where a cooperative got together to share the freezing and storage and processing of fish. And in the US, there's a, there's a group called Green Wave where the algae, uh, algae and oyster farmers got together and they have the processing and the, the growing of the spawn, the, the seed for the the hatchery for the, the algae and they own that together. So we have all these assets, consumable or durable, and we can share them between us in these three different ways. But the contract we can make between, between us as the owner and person that's using it is there's many different ways to do it. So it's not just selling things. We don't have to just sell things and buy things. We can also think about lending things. We can also think about pooling things. So this is in France, blah, blah, car is an example of pooling. So you own the car, and when you're driving somewhere, you invite other people to join you on that drive, and they pay a proportion of the trip. We can also think about leasing. We can also think about renting. The difference between the two is leasing. You create a con contract, for example, for a car for three years. After three years, you can choose, have an option to buy that car, and you get a discount because you've already paid for three years of leasing. Whereas renting, you rent for one week, one day, and so on. You can also think about a service contract between you and the person with, a, with an asset. And now we have the two more uh, technical ones. So this one is called you pay per unit. So this is what we do with electricity already. We pay per kilowatt hour. So we only pay for what we use, what we consume. We don't pay for the box, the cables, the infrastructure, and so on, just for the unit of use. And the second one is called functional results. We only pay for the results that we want. So if we go to a, a clothes laundrette, we take our clothes, they clean it for us, they use their, their choice of detergents, energy, machines, and so on, and we get the clean clothes. So clean clothes is the result. So why is product selling interesting? Well, we all know it's the market, it's, it's simple, it's common. Product lending could be cheaper or even free. Product pooling can be cheaper and also more social. And as we start to go around this diagram on this, on this left side, 
We're changing, as Monica talked about first thing in the morning, is that we're changing this relationship with the supplier. So now they, they still own the good when they rent it to you. So it can be in their, more, in their interest to make a higher quality product. Also, some companies want to get the product back at the end of the life. And if, if it's in a waste dump somewhere, they can't get to it. But if they're renting it out, they can get that product back and do something with it. So they have more control. Um, also, on this side, the products are being maintained by professionals, so they last longer at a higher quality. Also, we can get potential economies of scale, because often they're managing more than one asset. And it can be easier to upgrade to new technologies. So on the supply side, they have economies of scale, so they can invest in new technologies. On the buyer side, like for electricity, you can change uh, between operators to get a be the best ecological um, contract. <coughs> and so finally, overall, all these different ways of making contracts can reduce the total amount of goods being used in the market. So some examples, in Edinburgh they have a tool library instead of a book library where they lend out tools to their, their association. We've got product pooling, like in Finland example, where they, they pull together resources for freezing and storing of fish. We can imagine leasing boats to newcomers, new uh, boat, uh, new fishermen. They could lease instead of buying, perhaps. What about renting? So we, we spoke about renting nets, so we can rent uh, the, the trays, the fish trays. Already we get um, wooden pallets or plastic pallets that you can rent. Or in agriculture in France, you can rent a production line just for one week when you need it, when you're, you're, you're doing the bottling of the grapes, for example. We could also imagine a, a service contract, a maintenance contract. We could for nets. We could pay per service unit for cold fish. So we pay per kilo of the fish that's being frozen for us by a company. And we could go even more uh, sophisticated. We could go for anti-fouling as a service for a port. So anti-fouling is the paint that we paint on the bottom of our boats, or all, all the things that go in the water, to stop biology life growing on the bottom, bottom of our boats. And this is highly chemical uh, paint with lots of heavy metals. And so we can imagine maybe a group that can manage this in many different ways. We just pay for the results. We want this anti-fouled boats. And this company could do it in, in innovative, ecological ways. So now we go to repairing. If you want to repair something, often you need to collect it and transport it. And then you need to be able to sort it. Some sorting process needs to be done. And then some storage that so needs to be kept dry, clean, so it doesn't deteriorate. Once you have it, you can maintain it and repair it. But you can also refurbish or retrofit. So refurbishment, you can actually replace parts that you want to uh, change. And retrofit, you can even upgrade or change the usage because maybe your needs or the, your customer, if you're going to sell it, has changed. You can actually upgrade or change its use. And the most technical, which is more engineering, is the example could be a boat engine where a company, an engineering firm, will take that engine back they disassemble the whole engine, they, they look at all the parts, they replace, replace the parts that need to be replaced, they clean the pieces that need to be cleaned, <laughs> and they even upgrade the pieces that can be upgraded. They put it all back together again, back on the production line, and sell it for a discount with a warranty. So this all reduces waste because we're reusing things, and it maintains these assets for longer. So overall, we can, if we're very smart with these systems, we can lower again our input costs, and lower the amount of virgin materials that are being used. So some examples of this are the flag in uh, Madame Oleron, where they're cleaning and men mending oyster pouches. There's a flag in Ireland where they, they repair the plastic drums and floats. There's a project in Spain where they, 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 um, they mend the plastic trays for auction houses, and it's estimated it uh, saves the auction 65% cost compared to buying new, new trays. There's also a flag in France that fixes fishnets. There's also a flag in Italy that uh, teaches tool, uh, tool mending. And then we have, so these have all been maintenance and repair. This one is retrofit and refurbishment. And this project flag in uh, Malaga, they've actually created a technology they can retrofit to an existing engine on a boat that reduces the fuel consumption by 15% and reduces CO2 emissions in use. And finally, we can also think about purchasing remanufactured goods for our, 
our boat or renting them. So, for example, you can rent a remanufactured engine from Caterpillar or get some of the parts, particularly for the engine or the drive shaft, remanufactured or buy remanufactured. And so there's websites like iFixit where you can go online and people put videos and free content how to fix things. We can imagine doing the same thing within the flag. I already found an American guy with a video how to make uh, oyster um, cages and repair them. So reusing. So we have all these things that we, we can't lo no longer repair. We don't, uh, we don't want them anymore. We want to sell them or gift them to someone. We have all these internet um, platforms we can already do this. Or we also have these kind of charities like in France, MOUs, where we can take things and they redistribute them for us. And in Scotland, there's a Zero Waste manages a quality stamp called um, Revolve. And this Revolve basically puts some um, criteria for groups like MAUs to, to reach a certain quality standard of the things that they resell. That gives a, a better guarantee to the customer and also means MAUs can sell the product for a higher price. So what can we imagine for this? Well, we can imagine a second-hand uh, market for fishing overalls or the use of old fishing gear that we can give away or for low cost to young fishermen or for developing countries. We also have laws in France that supermarkets can no longer get rid of old food. They have to give it to a, a food bank or a charity. So again, we could think about maybe redistributing some of the fish or fish products that we can't use into these groups to feed our nourish our communities. And finally, linked to recycling is repurpose. We could think about, we have this old boat, why not repurpose it, <coughs> and reuse it for another use like this uh, vegetable garden. Thank you very much. <laughs>